thank you very much for this invitation. I feel very honored to speak at the um, Linux Foundation um, me Europe Member Summit. So it's really the first time that um, I am in direct contact with this um, uh, foundation and and I'm doing research now since many years on open source software. So my background is about 20 years ago, I wrote my master thesis about open source community building. Later on my PhD thesis on open source and community and, and firm involvement. And um, a couple of years ago, my habilitation thesis. So I'm very happy to be here and talk to you. Also, my background is a in, little bit in politics and that's why I'm leading since 15 years of some group, Parl Digi, Parliamentarian Group for Digital Sustainability, and that's why um, we are here um, today. In my day job, I'm head of a team of around uh, 60 people. We are an institute in Bern, in Switzerland, researching about the transformation of the public sector. So transformation towards where? Obviously digitalization but also towards sustainable development and innovation. So we want to make the public sector more agile, more resilient, and obviously more digital. And so we're researching with lots of different profiles, topics around which are completely non-technical, with legal people, with lawyers. We even have a, um, a judge um, involved in our um, teaching and research. And we are researching also about technology, AI and obviously um, also about open source software and that's the topic um, I'm going to talk to you today. Now um, quickly I will um, or maybe just one uh, announcement I brought some copies with me uh, from the open source Swiss open source study it's in German I'm sorry but uh, <coughs> with Google Translate and all the other AI tools, that's no problem. So um, that's something which we do now since 12 years. Every th three years we make a survey. So as we just heard uh, from Gabriele, I think it makes much sense to provide visibility to all this open source technology and innovation which, hap which is happening because usually we don't have such large marketing budgets in the open source areas, as you all know, and therefore it's even more important to have associations and research institutions to provide visibility through studies, to, through um, success stories, through directories, through rankings or whatever we can do. Okay, now let's start with this law uh, which has been um, talked about um, recently in, in certain media, which um, you might have seen, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I will give you first a short overview of what is going on open source software in Switzerland, then um, provide you a very short history of this new law, and then also show what is the important elements and the impact of this law, which is already now um, slowly being seen. Um, now, uh, sorry, this pointer is a little bit strangely behaving. No, it works. Um, you all know this claim, public money, public code. So that's something which the Free Software Foundation Europe is promoting since many years. I think quite successfully because it really um, was um, nothing completely new to the politicians. When we talk to them, they, it is very intuitive. So if we provide tax, if we pay taxes, it, it really makes sense to have the results of these taxes being openly available. And, and I think this is really something which is a very smart claim and it received lots of signatures. It even um, went over to the Wikimedia Foundation. In, in German they call it ÖG, ÖG, Öffentliches Geld, Öffentliches Gut, something like that. Uh, so it's uh, <laughs> very um, funny, um, which I think is, but it makes sense. It makes sense that if we pay something from the public we don't want to have private value, but we want to have public value. So public value, that's a research stream of its own. It really makes sense to build the digital infrastructure of the public sector um, completely open with open source technology. So I don't need to preach that to you, but it, I think it makes sense to say this as an opening statement. This is a very um, a German title um, in a newspaper, in a local newspaper a couple of years ago, which says, Open source software is gift or gifts of code, but it's not a gift um, because we want to Im 
improve the world or we want to make everybody happy, but because we are selfish, we, are, we really want to help ourselves. So there are open source software actually are selfish gifts. It's a little bit provocative, I agree, but um, I think it makes sense to say open source is not, not something which is kind of a religion or idealism. Well, Richard Solomon sees it differently, but I don't. Um, I think it makes sense to talk about providing open source, releasing open source software is not something like a hippie is doing, but it's really something good for business. And that's what we heard with Mercedes events and which all other companies um, you're representing obviously understand. Now in Switzerland, what's happening here, we had um, during pandemia, we had this COVID certificate where you could use the QR code, which is, it was a very good success story because actually the Swiss government um, implemented this whole certificates thing during a few months with the help of IT companies, but it released it completely open on GitHub. And what happened, um, funny enough, the, the Austrian government actually took over this code and built the Austrian COVID certificate app, and which helps um, really to also improve the, uh, the Swiss app. They provided bug reports and so on. So this was, I think, and it's still today, a good example of how open source releasing by government really helps um, improving the software. A second project um, I know of is Inosco Kaluma. This is a, a, a company in Switzerland which started with several cantons in Switzerland, um, an open source project which um, manages workflow with uh, some Python framework. And they have this international Kaluma open source project and the national, more local, organized government community in Oscar. And last but not least, you might have heard of the um, Open Rails Association, which was announced or a couple of years ago, but really started this year at the FOSDEM conference in Brussels, and which was now, is now from the Swiss um, Federal Train Association, but also with other associations. And they really develop together business critical software, which makes a lot of sense because here also technology and collaboration um, is really um, a key to innovation. Another interesting example in Switzerland, which happened a few years ago when the Swiss um, topographic um, agency, the Swiss Topo, they said, we want to improve our maps, mapping service, like Google Maps, but the Swiss maps, and they use open layers. Who of you knows open layers? A couple of you, so this is a very crucial element um, in providing these tiles. And they wanted to make it not just 2D, but 3D, and they needed some investment. And what they said that they did actually kind of institutional or public sector crowdfunding. They asked other public agencies to provide money in, in order to develop further this library. And they really um, achieved over 300K um, uh, US dollar from different agencies in Switzerland, but also from other countries and thus could actually develop further this platform. And that's how also funding is um, happening in the open source development. So what I did um, a couple um, uh, of years ago, I, I started some, some benchmarking, some collection of GitHub organizations to see how much open source they are providing. So this, this at the moment, it's only um, Swiss institutions and companies, and but um, maybe one day when I get more research funding, we'll in enlarge this. And what I can do now already, we, we filter it um, and get actually 14 Swiss federal agencies, which are today already providing some repositories on GitHub. You all know GitHub is huge, and there is a lot of inactive open source and just some Python scripts, which is not really relevant, but um, one of those are, for example, this COVID certificate and other production-ready software. So therefore, I think it, it's an indication that open source is happening in Switzerland even before this new law was released. So this, um, as a short introduction, um, shows you that Switzerland is not um, completely new to open source, but it's happening already, even if you don't have a law. Nevertheless, when you look at um, how Europe was doing, um, I was very jealous because I was uh, from many years I, I observing this and in Brussels and all over Europe, they're progressing and there's 
just one example, sharing reuse of software among the European member states is something which is very common and, and normal since many years. Nevertheless, in Switzerland, as we all know, we are a little bit kind of lost in the nowhere. So legal, there was a high legal uncertainty or unclearness. And so therefore, in Switzerland, we are very, in certain sense, very slow. But we want to also make it very safe and be assured that everything we do is correct and nothing is against the law. So that's uh, very typical for Swiss government. And so therefore, the IT people, of course, they published open source code, as I just showed on GitHub. However, the lawyers, um, most of them didn't understand what it is, open source. And if they realized, then, well, hold on, that's really nothing which you should do, because what is the legal foundation? The, the, the federal government only might, might act if there's a federal law about it which allows it. Usually, if it's below the radar, nothing happens. Um, but there was one project, especially interesting enough, from the federal court in Lausanne. The federal court in Lausanne, they actually started Open Justitia 13 years ago. And they started a platform which allows them to um, collaborate and to open up their court management software. And they wanted to also help other um, local courts to use it, which was very good. And we support this and um, um, did some publish some, some, uh, some political um, as, uh, pushes, and we asked the, the government, the Bundesrat, the federal um, government, to what could the government do to even further um, support other administrations to do this open source collaboration. However, there was a little IT company in Switzerland, in Bern, where actually I live, they objected and they said, well, we actually sell our proprietary software to courts. So that's actually destroying our market. And the government, and especially not the federal court, the highest court in Switzerland, should actually interfere with market and with the industry. And they would basically, as many years ago, Steve Ballmer said, Linux is a cancer thing. They said, like, open source is, is the, the killing thing for the IT industry. And, and so, therefore, they actually also had a politician. They gave him um, this um, hint to really ask the question, so why does the federal court destroy the business of a local IT company with open source software? And so this was the beginning of a long 10 years of legal war, uh, because then actually the government asked uh, professors, lawyers, to make a, um, advice, a, a, a gutachten, like a long special expert um, opinion. And this obviously uh, led to, in 2014, it was published like 10 years ago, the legal opinion was it is not allowed. The government may not open source software because that's actually interfering with the market. It destroys the, the innovative Swiss IT industry and it's bad for, um, and it's too much government anyway. So that's basically was the main reason. It's like 100 pages, huge lawyer stuff. And I was, frankly, I was very, um, yeah, I was very uh, disappointed and, and kind of destroyed about because I, I knew, well, this actually is the legal opinion which lasts and it, it's the end of the Swiss open source movement. Luckily, with lawyers, what do you do if one lawyer says you cannot do something? <laughs> you ask another lawyer. <laughs> you ask another lawyer, and so that's what we did. We asked other professors, law professors. We asked them, what would you answer if we ask you this and this question? And so basically, we knew the, the answer. And we asked them, please write a long, very academic opi legal opinion <laughs> about, is it allowed for the public sector to release open source software? And. Um, surprisingly, they said, yes, it is allowed, no problem about that. <laughs> so it does not distort the market, it does not need a legal basis. It's something which actually is kind of a Randnutzung, it, it supports the, the, the use of software and the open source code, as we all know, is not the finished solution. It needs companies which implement it and integrate it and support it and um, operate it and train it and everything it needs. So therefore, Luckily, we had the legal opinion of more innovative law professors. The canton of Bern, actually the 
region I live, they um, issued soon after a law that said, well, now the canton of Bern is allowed to open source software because they also funded this uh, legal opinion. And so therefore, on the canton level, already in 2018, we had this MBAC article which allows explicitly the release of open source software. Nevertheless, our goal was the whole Switzerland, the, the, the federal government, and so um, there was a draft version of a law in 2019, I think, which now included an article which luckily said, based on our legal opinion, or the second legal opinion, the government is allowed to open source software if certain conditions are met. And for example, if it's possible and it makes sense, then make open source and yeah, so it's, you can do open source, but certain conditions need to be met. So uh, we said, well, that's good, but we want to make it more stronger. We want to make open source by default. So we provided from our open source association, CH Open, our Swiss, uh, which also um, supports the study, um, that we want to change this law. So this is kind of a Vernehmlassungs process in Switzerland, which you can comment on law drafts of laws. Um, interestingly, they actually took over this um, new um, or um, less restrictive formulation and they said, yes, it is allowed uh, to open source software if it's possible, if the things are um, met. So it, it was an improvement in the second version of the draft and this was the version which came into the parliament and when the parliament actually starts um, debating about this thing. And, that's where actually um, we activated our group, Parlodigi, Parliamentarian Group for Digital Sustainability, which consists of parliamentarians from all kinds of parties, from the complete left to the complete right uh, wing, and which actually has a very strong position in Swiss government. We do open source software, but also we, we did the open government thing, open data, and n now we start to do open source AI, whatever <coughs> its exact definition. Maybe. Now, and, and, and I'm very thankful for all the companies which support us for many years. There are international open source providers, but also local open source providers, which obviously is necessary to have some office running. Now, in this um, um, discussion, actually, was very interesting. One parliamentarian, Gerhard Andre, he said that uh, the, in Switzerland we have a two chamber. Um, Parliament, where the one chamber represents the population, the other chamber represents the cantons. So the National Nationalrat, they represent the population. They were more innovative. They said, yes, it is by default, every code should be open source. And the Ständerat, the representatives of the cantons, they said, no, no, we want to stick with the federal Bundesrat thing, and we want to keep it a little bit more restrictive. And then, interestingly, an email from um, Matthias Michel, one of the parliamentarians, to his um, colleague. He said, well, we, we propose a compromise. In Switzerland, we love compromises. And so therefore, um, he said, well, the thing is, open source is by default. If no third party rights are um, infringed or if there are any um, security reasons. So and this was the moment where actually we were very happy because now in the final version of the law, it really says every federal agency has to open source its code, all of its code, except if third party rights or security reasons prevent it. So that's when we all already, um, we could say, well, we are finished, the law is written, and now everything is done. Obviously it's not, uh, uh, laws are um, sometimes not implemented, so I, I actually act, was actively contacting people from OSOR to report about it. Uh, you might have read it on the OSOR news. Nothing happened, but suddenly in the summertime, you, you might have heard of Stephen Falken Nichols. He reported on Satinet, and this actually re released some interest, even from YouTubers. So my my 18-year-old son said, "Well, you, the, the law is in on YouTube and TikTok." And so, whoa, whoa. I was very very proud that my son actually showed this. And so this now 180k views video, and um, you might have seen even. Uh, Jack Dorsey and Elon Musk re noted that um, this Swiss open source by default law is now implemented. And 
um, which we may discuss if this is so cool or not, but anyway. <laughs> Um, so what is the content of this law? Um, very quickly, it's very simple in a way that it says, first, I translated it, um, all the code has to be disclosed by the government employees or third parties, except unless the rights of third parties or security related reasons would preclude or restrict this. So it's, which says in open source is general principle except if we buy proprietary licenses, which we cannot, uh, the government has no rights to open source it, obviously. And then the second thing is very interesting, what are security related reasons? <coughs> I'm asking you, you are the <laughs> professionals, what are good re security re related reasons not to open source code? So we will see that right now the identification software is being written by the government, the EID. So and there actually they argue, oh, that's too, too, too delicate, we cannot open source that. I don't know, I don't know. But um, at least they have to really argue why they don't. And that's the important element. By default, it's open and you have to explain and really um, argue if it's, why it's not open source. And the second part of the MBAG is also very important because it says it's not only allowed or the government has to publish the code and dump it on GitHub or any other place, they actually are allowed to make community building, to provide supplementary services, in particular integration, maintenance, ensuring information security and support. So it, this is, um, I think, at least as important because we all know the code itself is the basis, but you need more. You need knowledge transfer. You need people who are um, somewhat employed to actually build up a community, to support integration, to um, discuss maybe issues, security issues, or feature requests, or cr create a roadmap, or make events, conferences, and so on. So this is very important and Obviously, there, there's a restriction, no market distortion may be caused because of this web law thing, but unless um, this is um, secured, then the government may also provide services around this open source software, and this is actually the, the basis, so we also hope that now the Swiss government starts also open source projects in a, in a good way, that they really care about it, they take on ownership, and. They provide um, activities. Soon, um, in the next few days, there will be published some tools and some guidelines how this Swiss government has to publish open source. As we all know, there are different ways to do it. Is it published on the GitHub account of, all, of these uh, federal agencies or on the GitHub accounts of the developers or of the companies, of the providers? So there are different flavors of open source community building. And so they, as you can see, the complexity is rising when, once the government takes it over. But uh, at least we have some paper and some guidelines. What is, uh, what is even more important, um, that also in public procurement, the government now is reflecting. And I, I made some screenshots from several um, public procurement documents starting this year because the, um, the MBOG is now enforced since January 1st. And it, it's really interesting if you search for MBAG, this abbreviation, then you find a really couple of um, IT procurement um, and their multi-million IT projects, which now say, well, you have, as a provider, you have to release your code. You have to follow this MBAG Article 9 which is the open source article, and you have to publish the code. And in order to publish it, you might need some experience and also professionally, professionality or and, and skills. And so therefore, we actually evaluate, you have to have experience in open source software development. The moment is only 2%, well, it's not much <laughs> weight in the um, whole thing, but it actually is a signal. It's a signal to the market that also the classical non-open source minded IT companies, which are obviously still a lot around, um, they actually re need to gain experience. And um, I found other articles where they, for example, they um, have this open source ESO thing, which um, 
uh, the open chain project, you know, uh, where the security and compliance, for example, are really um, enforced. And this, this is it. So um, I think um, the, the law is now in place and we have first signs of impact. And so therefore I really hope and wish that Switzerland now is really gaining uh, speed in open sourcing. And yeah, if you have any other further questions or um, um, uh, requests, please contact me and I'm very happy to connect on LinkedIn or wherever. Thank you very much.